All right, Greg and Bruce, we are up to IP 17. And this little gem right here, 10 Foot Faces, the three song um, EP by the band. It looks like Devin's got a copy here. It's a matching one there, Devin. Matching, yes. So we have two members of the band. Um, today we have Devin Carson, a guitarist and singer, and Chuck Larson drummer and percussionist of 10 foot faces so we wanted to welcome you guys both here to discuss this little gem today thank you both for joining thank you for having us yeah thanks for having us thank yeah. you so i wanted to know first of all when i see this in the, the this big font that stands up and it spells out 10 foot faces where did this name of this band come from who named it 10 foot faces and why well, we had been kicking around names and we were we started a surf instrumental band and our, our bass player, Tony, who's long, no longer with us, he knew a friend who, I guess he was a surfer or a wannabe surfer or something, and he came in one time and said, oh, dude, you should have been at the beach today. The waves were gnarly. They were like 10-foot faces, man. And it kind of stuck in his head. He thought that was kind of funny. And, and he mentioned that to us. We go, wow, that's perfect, you know, because it's something that hasn't been used and it's kind of mysterious. It doesn't necessarily, unless you know about surfing, you don't necessarily acquaint with that either. So it wasn't so obvious as like one of the names that we pondered was the Calabungas, which that flew about this far and then dropped like a lead zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Oh, perfect. I love that. Yeah. Not being a surfer myself, but when you explain it, it sounds obvious um, from the waves. And I should have mentioned that the band to me sounds like a punk surf band that's uh, influenced heavily from 60s music. So um, yeah, that the name definitely fits. So it's a three song EP. Um, so the on one side, we got um, Don't Want Love. And on the other side, we've got Sandfuck and Dangerous Visions. So how did these three songs come about? Well, let's uh, start off with Don't Want Love. So I think that's a Tony song. Is that correct? Yeah, Tony Fernandez, a bass player, wrote and sang on it. And um, he pretty much put the whole song together. I don't think we really had much input other than Rod coming up with the lead um, for it. Other than that, it was, it was all Tony's um, creation. And I don't know what his inspiration was for. I guess he was kind of like tired of hearing like typical love songs. And so he thought he'd flip the script or something. That's my best guess. But um, we really liked it because it was a real powerhouse rocker that just knocked your socks off. You know, when he first played it to us, we were like, oh, yeah, that, that's in. We're going with that. Yeah. <laughs> I will have to say that I've been listening to this record uh, and preparing for this again for the last week, and I cannot get that song out of my head. So I'm a little <laughs> bit upset with you guys. So I'm in the grocery store and I'm singing Don't Want Love and I'm look, looking for refried beans. So I, I blame you guys. So. Chuck, I wanted to know as the drummer, um, when these songs were brought to you, like how did you come up with your 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 drum pieces were you given any direction or just from feel and your own input well a lot of the songs um uh, you know Devin and i you know we both really like surf music at that time we were talking about it a lot we're influenced by like the ventures all that stuff that was going on so i would just pretty much play that style if i hear a a song or any type of guitar guitar um melody or structure of, of chords or whatever it would, you know, just play with whatever fits, basically. And since it was like the surf oriented stuff, I would just play that that style of music, and I liked it a lot. It was just a lot of fun. Usually, what they would show me would just, I would just follow it. It would just fall right in. Okay, okay. So you weren't given any guidance from either Devin or Tony or Rod. Well, there might have been something, but I, I don't remember. I just remember just just doing it, just playing it. You know. Okay. Well, I think one of us might have said we're going to need more cowbell on that song. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. And, and you see that there's no cowbell anywhere on any of the songs. <laughs> that that's the problem there. <laughs> <laughs> so Devin, we if we flip over the single to the second side, there's an oddly titled song, Sandfuck. And I believe that this is your piece. What 
Yeah. Why sand fire? I I honestly I can't even remember. It may have been I went to the beach with a, a girlfriend or something and we never did anything on the beach, but it went through my head like what if you were to try to do that? Like that would be kind of a difficult, messy thing to do. <laughs> that may have, that could have been the inspiration, but um it's 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 very vague and fuzzy. I remember <laughs> yeah. to come up with the um the riff you know and uh it just I, I can't even recall how i wrote that song <laughs> so so it's not exactly a real life it, it's not a, not autobiographical no not really no it not was directly really, only up here imagining <laughs> it was gone for someone <laughs> yeah So dangerous visions. Who came up with that song? Uh, I did too. That was my. Uh, when we first started out, we were basically playing all instrumentals, and that was when we had a, another guitar player, Steve Hansen, who was the original founding member before. And then we got Tony Fernandez, but originally it was, it was Steve, Chuck, and I. And we were like Chuck said, we were really into the Ventures and listening to them did quite a bit, and we started just it just started coming out like we started writing songs you know some of them were really simple and rudimentary and, and you know we listen to other stuff and say oh man it'd be cool if we had a song that was kind of like that and that thing or something and um i just wanted something that was kind of like uh maybe a little more dick dale-ish kind of a little more hard-hitting than the ventures style so um that was just something where again once again i was just playing around and and I had, I think I had the melody in my head and then I kind of sussed it out. But um, it was a fun song because it had a lot of dynamics, you know, there's like breaks and, and, and rhythm and boop, boop. And if it wasn't just your typical sing song or, or, you know, some surf music was very blues based, you know, especially like the Beach Boys kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, one, four, five regressions. And then the other flip side is kind of the Dick Dale school, where it's it's heavily influenced by Middle Eastern and, or other European ethnic styles and stuff kind of mixed in there. Because I think he was, uh, I believe he was. You have a lot of those, you have a lot of those minor mode kind of yeah, playing. Yeah, exactly, those kind of scales and stuff. So I was looking to do something that wasn't so you know, uh, typical and straightforward. And uh, that was the result because we, we discussed, you know, what are we going to put on this record? And at first, I, I don't know if we were planning on just doing two songs, but we decided we could do three because it was short, but we definitely wanted it. We don't want love was like on for sure. And then we said, well, let's have another vocal, but we got to have an instrumental in there too, just to kind of keep with our, our theme, our tradition, you know, and, Throughout our entire career, we'd always throw at least one instrumental into our set, even when band members changed down the line and our style changed considerably. We always kind of stuck to that that uh, trademark of having at least one instrumental in the set. So, got it. If it's perfect. Yeah. Too. Chuck, I wanted to ask about recording. You recorded at Lyceum with Vitas Matere. Um, who I'm a big fan of. Um, do you remember the recording session and uh, how that went? Yeah, it was great. I, I just remember it was a very live room. It's like it, it was still under construction and it was still bare walls. It looked like it was just uh, drywall and, and they hadn't painted it yet. And so it was very oh. live and it's just like, oh. I think it was just a few takes, I, maybe just one. I don't remember. Do you remember how many takes it was? I, just, I think it was oh, it might have been one take. A couple. We may have done gone into one and said, oh, we need to adjust something or do something. But I think probably one, two, maybe three at the very most. And we were yeah, really yeah. a bit and we were, we were real tight. We practiced. And I don't know, did we practice recording those songs on a four track maybe? I know we did on for our album. We practiced recording no. a bunch of suss them out. I don't think we did on that one, but but we we've been playing. Yeah, no, I think we just we just we just rehearsed them ourselves. Just went through them a lot. We we played them live. Yeah. And so they were, they were pretty ingrained. We had them pretty ingrained, and uh, 
it, as I remember, it was smooth sailing. It just, it was yeah, easy. Yeah, it was fun. Technical troubles or anything. And it was like, it was a very lively room. The floor was concrete, the walls were drywall. I don't even know if there was any damping on the roof either. It was just like, wow. Was and that the, the, um, the, the, the pool house? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, you had a back exactly. room converted to a studio, yeah. Uh, I love that room. I was in a band called White Glove Test, and we recorded our second album, Leap, in that same room. It was, it's a, a great little spot there. Well, I Bruce, I have a question for you. Um, how did you discover these guys to put this out on IPR? Yeah, how'd you all hook up? You know, I, I'm pretty sure I saw you guys play a, a gig, and... Um, you know, I, I think I probably saw some reviews of what you were doing. And, you know, I was a big Ventures fan when I was a teenager as well. So I definitely had the appreciation for the surf music as well as a lot of obscure 60s music. And so just you guys just pulled it all together really well. Um, and honestly, I don't remember where I would have seen you guys play. Maybe the anti-club or something like that. But... Um, but I just, I, you know, I remember enjoying the fact that you had several different styles that you were all working in. Like, you know, you know, you different songwriters all had a different style of working. And also the fact that you guys were really tight. I mean, you, you just, you played great. And um, I don't remember exactly how I came to approach you guys about putting the, the single out or this EP out, but I just... You know, I think it's like a lot of the the early releases that I did. It's just I I I wanted one. I wanted a record of you guys. <laughs> and this the best way to do that is to offer to put one out. You know. Yeah, that's what I remember. I think you came and you maybe you came to see some other bands or to see us. I don't know, but it was probably at the Anti Club. And yeah. You approached us after we played and said, "You guys." interested in putting out a record and we looked at each other like well, you would yeah, yeah. <laughs> what took so long for someone to come up and ask us <laughs> you know, like we didn't have any connections really and didn't yeah. really know how to even break into the whole thing you know so it was just kind of a late at our doorstep and we were like well this guy's really cool and he's got cool bands on his roster and uh he wants to do something okay let's go let's do it yeah. So when you when you guys went into Lyceum, were you recording it to be on IPR or did you record it first? And no, yeah, it was a specifically a project to do for independent projects. Yeah, it, oh, it, excellent. It, uh, oh. I guess Bruce funded the recording. I I don't recall if we put any money into it either, but um, we, it was you know certainly I I don't know maybe he recorded us for free because he was just setting it up and he wanted a test run. It could have been something like that. Because, I mean, I can recall that we could barely afford to put strings on the guitars and <laughs> you know, a couple of years afterwards or something, you know, we were just scraping by. So I, as I, now the more I think about it, he might have recorded this for free just to give it a test run. Ah. So, yeah, I seem to remember something like that because, you know, Vetus was, yeah, doing his, getting his studio built. And, and you know, Greg and I recorded our third Savage Republic album there, the Jamaharia Democratique album was recorded in that studio. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a great opportunity for to record with Vetus. And I like that the live sound that he got, he's, he's really live. Yeah. Especially being a musician, he had, the, he had the sense and the feel yeah. of, of, of how musicians were going to perform and how he wanted it to sound. And, and, he, and I don't think he spent all that much time for being someone who was not a full-time career recording engineer. He was pretty impressive the way he put it together. And we make, I think we mixed it there. I can't remember now. Maybe we mixed it somewhere else. But either way, whatever we he put on tape to work with, you know, it was it was all there. You know, we didn't have to do a bunch of fixing and stuff. Yeah, the sound and the tone is kind of really different. And but you know, you look at a lot of '60s recordings, and it was kind of like, well, this place sounds like here, and this sounds like that, and 
there you go, you know, but um, it, it, it fit the energy of our music, you know, I yeah. think it, I'd rather have it a little on the harsh kind of uh, ragged edge than something kind of like dull and 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 uh, boxy and, and kind of like so so many or global a, recordings back then came out like, you know. Yeah, it has a it has the the raw energy. Yeah, and actually, it it went really smooth. It, it was almost like a field recording. It's like it's like they just let us go. They just let it let it happen. There was no nitpicking over anything, no changes of anything. You know, it's just like uh, no real production almost. It was just it was just basically recording and getting the right sound and going for it, and that was it. It sounds perfect. I mean, the recording sounds like it. it perfectly fits the band's um, aesthetic from from what, what I can hear. It, it doesn't feel like it's, um, it feels like it's doing the band justice the way that it was recorded, in my opinion. So. Yeah. Devin, you were holding up something and that I wanted to ask about that with the artwork. So I believe that the band um, worked together with Bruce to get this and there's multiple covers Devin you showed it so in the savage impressions book which I like to refer to often it shows that there are multiple covers Devin you have those so yeah, well, yeah. On, on the first run we did we did both the large face one that you were holding up and then this one too as well it may have been that um the large one I know was using a lot of ink <laughs> yeah and we thought well let's let's Maybe we could like uh, cut back a little here or there, but but the back remained the same. So that was all part of the same run. And then later, I get apparently they all sold because later Bruce came back and flipped the script and put the reverse, the backside artwork on the front, and then he took the artwork from the actual disc itself and put it on the back. Because uh, with the first release, we have a. Um, an insert we put in there as well. Yes. Get it out of here. <laughs> it's tight. I've got a copy of that too. Yeah, and uh, which which includes the band upside down here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Bruce, did you have um, uh, what what was your input into putting this out, and what did you think when you th th these guys handed you um, their idea for the artwork? Well, you know, I just thought I needed to do something fun with it. And so that was why I turned them upside down. And, and you know, the second cover that, that Devin showed with the, um, the artwork that was originally on the back being on the front, the reason that that happened is that somehow we ended up with several hundred extra pieces of vinyl from the pressing. Oh. Not enough, not enough covers for them. So after we sold through, you know, what we had, for the covers, I just thought, well, I just I'll print up another couple hundred covers, but let's let's play around with it, make it a little different, make it special. You know, I mean, that's the thing about uh, about why there's so many variations of a lot of the the covers on the early independent project releases. Once I got on the letterpress, is when you're standing there hand feeding, you know, hundreds of these through the press you kind of want to do something different and it's it's like okay i'm putting this on the press again do i want to do 200 more of the same thing i did before no let's play around with it let's do something different let's have fun with this project so. nice so, so with the um the label with that uh the little a little rotating man who, yeah. who came up with that because that thing uh, that thing is just amazing that was yeah. rod that was uh, our, uh, the other guitar player, another member who sadly is no longer with us. He was um, a really good um, drawing, like cartoon type style drawing. And uh, I think he may have made some flip books, so the animated flip mm -hmm. books before. And we were talking some, what could we do to make the label really different and interesting and like entertaining, you know? Same thing. You get bored of same old thing. There's the label, and and on the back we use that. That was the picture that ended up on the um, the insert as well. But um, 
I guess I don't know who had the, the concept, but it was Ron himself, maybe, of doing this rotating animation thing, and we didn't know if it would really work. And it sort of works, but I think it worked better if you had a piece of cardboard with a hole cut out. Oh. Just so you could see one image at a time, make your eyes focus better. Yeah. It's just, it's kind of kind of cool that um because it's it it has this feeling of you know like a nineteen early nineteen hundreds those you know arcade kinescope kind of thing yeah. kind, of, kind of fits in with the aesthetic of the uh just the uh you know like the letterpress printing and the hand done stuff so it, it's kind of a it, it just works really well. There's a cool YouTube video where somebody actually did it at the right speed and you can actually see the animation works. So if yeah. you if you look up the, the 10 foot faces don't want love um, video on YouTube, one of them, somebody put that up and it's pretty cool. You can see the, yeah. the little yeah, guy watching. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's great. It's great. Yeah, I, I was pleasantly surprised when I found that because the whole time we were kind of like, man, this was like, you know, such a cool idea, but it didn't quite play out the way we thought it would. Right. right. And uh, <laughs> there was no way to know really till it was done. So, you know, we just threw our, uh, threw the dice, you know, as it turns out, I, I guess it had to be the proper speed to make it work. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. I don't know if either one of you may be able to answer, but this is kind of a nerdy question. But in the, um, the dead wax, um, somebody carved in forsooth verily on one side and hoi polloi on the other side. Any <laughs> idea where this came from? Chuck, you... Uh, it sounds like you may know. Yeah, I think I think uh, Devin and I talked about. It. I think he came up with the forsooth verily, and I came up with the hoi polloi, and oh. we just decided yeah. to put that in. Hoi yeah. polloi, you know, like as an expression, like woohoo, yeah, yahoo, or something. And it was actually Tony, our bass player, who I think he got that from. It was from the Little Rascals. It was oh. an episode where they were putting on like a Shakespearean play. And it might have been Buckwheat or one of those kids who was trying to sound Shakespearean and throwing out words and he was saying, for soup, barely. <laughs> <laughs> Stuck in his head. And, you know, he's, I don't know how we came up with putting that on the record, but it was just something that, you know, he or us were kind of saying at the time. And we'd seen other, once in a while, we'd seen other records where somebody had written something there on the vinyl. And, you know, usually they just put a number in there or something. And we thought, well, you know, we're just trying to draw out as much stuff as possible to just be entertaining and, and interesting. And like nowadays you have your, you know, your digital where they'll have a, a, a hidden cookie track or whatever they call that. So this was kind of in that vein of like, hey, let's, for people who are paying close attention, They'll they'll find something else like hidden little gem to entertain them and make them wonder what does this mean, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's me. I'm the nerdy guy that's looking at that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. For the Easter. Thing. It's cool of thought. Yeah. So somehow I don't know how I ended up with it, but I got a test pressing of the of this particular EP. So I think I got it on eBay or something. Bruce, wow. you must have sent some out. Um, yep. But um, it also has the um, in the dead wax. It has the same thing, so it's it must have been from the exact same plates that pressed up that ended up pressing up the actual. Uh, yeah, I mean that's what the test pressings are: is that they make the plate and then you they do a test with those either blank labels or minimal test pressing labels, and then you listen to it and make sure it's okay. And if it's okay, then they go ahead and press from it. Um, if there's if there's a problem, then they'll have to recut you know, the side, and then you might have different writing in the, in the middle. Ah, uh, got it, got it. All right, well, we have a few minutes left, and I, um, it's not an IPR release, but I did want to mention this record. So um, this came out on Pitch a Tent Records, the Camper Van Beethoven label, also, and that started off with IPR, so... There's the connection. So days of corn dogs and yo-yos. So this is I highly recommend this record. Um, again, it's not IPR, but it's a great record. So recording that record, um, did you approach it any differently than you did the EP? 
because it's a full length. It sounds like you guys recorded some demos for that one. Yeah, we um, we did do practice recording ahead of time uh, for that record. I was going to say that the whole reason we ended up working with Camp Van Beethoven because when we were working on the Don't Want Love record and literally printing the covers, their album, their first album, uh, Our Beloved Revolutionary Sweetheart, was being dried on some other racks next to ours. And Bruce had mentioned that they're a really cool band. And when we finally heard them, we thought, oh, these guys are great. And eventually we got to meet them and they really liked our stuff. And we hooked up and, and we played a lot of shows with them and, um, you know, really good friends with them. And they started their label and asked us if, if we wanted to put an album out. And we were like, sure, that sounds great. And they had worked up a deal with Rough Trade Records to do the packaging and distribution. So, man, this is a great opportunity, and we ended up, um, we recorded this on a uh, 16-track, two-inch at the Radio Tokyo studio in Venice with um, um, Ethan James. Ethan James, yeah. Ethan James, rest his soul, too. And um, we were, you know, at that point, we'd been doing a lot in, for quite a few years since. So, and we were real tight, but we did do a four track test practice recording of the, all the songs and to work out all that stuff because we knew we'd be on a tight timeline in the studio. Camper Van, you know, offered to put up a certain amount of money and we pulled together some money and uh, we did it. And I think it was two weekends we went down and we recorded uh, most of the tracks on the first weekend. The, finished up the next week and doing overdubs and vocals and then probably by the Sunday of the second week and we were mixing. Wow. Uh, you know, there's certain things where we didn't really have the time to really realize and, and suss out every little detail of, of how we want it to be. But we, we, we even recorded two songs in another studio in Eagle Rock uh, we were, we were before Penguin recording on an eight track and we ended up putting them on there and we also recorded a few sound effects and stuff like that that we threw in to make it uh, interesting you know so many records are just boring and you know back in the 60s you know what really the beatles you know they go back to throwing in weird little odd things here and there and, you know once they they got the freedom to do that but uh so we just wanted to make a record that was like really told who we were and where we were coming from and, and our our sense of humor our, our sensibilities and whatnot and the, the cover artwork was done by Chuck's girlfriend at the time who also did the artwork on the back side of the Don't Want Love EP oh wow and then the back side here which is like the most craziest ridiculous thing ever put on a cover I think yeah. um <laughs> we had this idea that we were wearing all these loud, crazy clothes, and we wanted to do something that incorporated those colors and themes. So we took pictures of all the fabric and then printed them out, put them on a big paste board, and then took all these other photos that we had, had taken of us live or messing around and cut them all out, glued them all on there. It was a big, probably two foot square board or something. And then we took it to the printer. And we had it done up, and uh, you know, it was just spontaneous kind of a thing where we we were just kind of going with our impulses, and just like we wanted something that when people were thumbing through the records, when they pop through this one, they just go, "Whoa, what the heck is that?" Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if they're any good or not, but this artwork is enough to intrigue me, so maybe I'll check it out. You know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it, like I said, things seem to have gotten real boring in the artwork department. A lot of what was a lot of the bands we played with at the time, you know, nobody had much money. And doing this kind of stuff was a full color process. All their stuff was, wasn't cheap either. So a lot of bands I, I know that they, they probably did the best they could with their budgets and, and you know. But we just kinda of wanted to stand out in the crowd, you know, that was always our thing was uh you know, we don't want to just be pigeonholed in just because we're playing these kind of bands and this and that. We're not the same thing. We're our own crazy mad entity, you know? So that's where all that came from. Uh, another great record. 
And it sounds it like it all comes about because of Bruce and independent projects. Um, e yeah. Even the the follow up album. Yeah, Bruce uh, with, with Bruce because he gave us free reign, you know, to do our our you know ideas and stuff. And uh, the Camper Van, they were just as great to work with because they were coming from the exact same place we were doing, you know, working band and all that, and knowing, you know, just how everything worked. They were very sympathetic to our, you know, our ideas and how we thought them. So that was a really good partnership. Excellent, excellent. So we got about two minutes left. I wanted to thank you, everybody, for joining in. I absolutely love this EP. Bruce, thank you for putting it out. Thank you for going to see them at the Anti Club. So yeah. that so this happened. So um, I'm glad you put it out. Me too. Thank you for your interest. Thank yeah. you very much for your interest. Oh, thank you guys so much. We really appreciate. It. Greg, any last words before we I, cut off? I think that I think that pretty much cover covers it. You know, thanks a lot for joining us. It was a lot of fun and uh, love the music. Again, like kind of like Jeff, you know, prepping for it. Uh, been been listening, been listening to a, a lot of your stuff, and it's. It, it stands the test of time, <laughs> definitely. Absolutely. Thanks, Greg. And that's a cool shirt, by the way. That's an, I like that shirt. <laughs> I, I carry my dinner with me always. It makes me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Thanks again. I really appreciate you guys joining. And um, um, I'm glad you guys are still around. So stay strong, stay healthy. And Thank you. thanks for putting out this great music. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, peace, brother. All right, thank you guys. Have a good night. Have a drive safe.